Thanks for having me. I'm actually a Californian living in Canada, so I think in Richard Gilbert's eyes, maybe I come out neutral. Um, it's, it's been great being here to Michigan. It's my first time to Michigan, and everybody here is just as friendly as had been rumored. Um, thanks for having me. I, I want to talk about this, this nexus of peak oil and climate change, because I see these as really being the two major sort of change drivers that are really going to be shaking up the way that we plan our cities and the way we do just about everything. Now, uh, about a year ago, I was invited by the Southern California Association of Governments to do some research around peak oil and climate change scenarios, looking at what is the future coming forward and how are these things going to impact Southern California. Um, and this is Jim, who runs this place, picked this up and wanted me to come talk about that. Um, and this, this work on creating scenarios draws on an earlier piece of work, which you may have seen in the transition handbook and in other places, which is about using scenarios as tools for talking about these very difficult and kind of tough issues, peak oil and climate change. Um, so I, I, would, I think that going forward, to the extent that we can start thinking about how to use scenarios as tools, they can be very powerful in, in trying to bring this message forward. So in terms of three things that I want to touch on is what future are we planning for? Because I think we'll find that many of us have a very different idea of the future than maybe what it is that we're heading towards. And when we look at what we're planning for in our cities, it's reflecting those alternate visions of the future. I also want to touch on that distinction between climate change and peak oil, because at the moment there is a real focus on climate change and a lot of energy. But there are some very important distinctions that affect how it is we're going to be going forward. And then finally, the last piece is going beyond just talking about sustainability, but how do we become resilient as a city? And when I talk about a dynamic city, it's, it's bringing those two things together, one that's aiming towards sustainability, but also has this uh, factor of resilience. So in terms of where I'm coming from, this is uh, Vancouver, uh, downtown Vancouver. These are actually all mostly residential towers. Um, there's no freeway uh, running through the, the downtown part of the city. Um, it's seen a real resurgence of people living downtown. Um, a lot of, uh, we've actually been adding population to the city downtown while reducing vehicle travel. Uh, the new Olympic Village is going in over here. It's going to be, you know, doing sewer heat recovery and a number of interesting things. So there's this real kind of nexus of, of interesting effort and energy going on in the city around sustainability and green building and smart growth and all of those types of things. Now, of course, when you zoom out a little bit, this, the areas around the city are just like everywhere else. There was, we have sprawl, we have all the other kind of typical artifacts of an oil-dependent society. And what we also have is a provincial government that is wanting to do these major road expansions. And what we look back where that's coming from is they have in their idea, this idea of the future, where they're saying, we have this amount of uh, container traffic today, and sometime in the future, that's going to double or triple. So they have this vision in their heads about the future being some extrapolation of past trends. And that is translating directly into an investment of billions and billions of dollars in these uh, highway expansion projects, which I would, well, I will subsequently be arguing, are potentially stranded assets. So of course, the question is, what, what future are we really planning for? And we've had a lot of discussion about peak oil. And I think peak oil is really one of the, the sort of major things that's going to flip us one way or the other. For many of us who talk about the future, we're kind of imagining this, this, this future where we have this new technology that comes on board to basically substitute in to the way that we currently do things. And if oil declines slowly enough, and the normal economy keeps going, that's maybe a future that can happen. But if, on the other hand, oil does deplete much more quickly than we're expecting, we're looking at a very different type of future. Um, and I'm using this a little bit facetiously, but there are many people looking at peak oil who are talking about collapse scenarios and other types of things like this. And so when I look at this, I say, OK, well, if, if it happens slowly, we can have what I call a techno markets future, technology and markets really driving the transition. Um, if, it, if oil depletion happens very quickly, it's more of a lean and local future, where it's about local solutions um, and local economies. Now, of course, I believe it's probably something more in between these two, where we do have new technology, but it's not necessarily plugging into our current lifestyle as a one-to-one -one substitute. 
we're also doing a kind of uh, ad hoc adaptation of the stuff that we already have lying around. Um, this is an example of a camel bus from Havana where they've taken a, a freight hauling truck and converted it to haul people. You can get about 200 people on one of these things. Um, so I think we're going to be looking at in the future some combination of technology, but also this kind of idea of adaptation or, or using what we already have lying around. And of course, when I come back again to this, this project, I say, okay, this stuff that we're investing in today, this, this, this is the infrastructure that's going to be with us for the next 5, 10, 50, 100 years. The stuff that we're planning and investing in today is going to be serving us and our grandkids in a post-oil, post-carbon future. So when we look at investing money in these things, is this something that pays us back in either future? Or does it only make sense in a future that looks like the past? So the next piece, um, just to talk a little bit about peak oil versus climate change. Uh, maybe since I have the audience here, in the next 10 years, who thinks uh, climate change will impact their lives more than peak oil? There's a couple of hands. Um, maybe I'll just put that reciprocally. Who, who, who thinks or peak oil is going to impact their lives more than climate change in the next 10 years? Okay, now I've, I've asked, I've gone, given presentations in California where that, that was entirely reversed. There was almost no peak oil literacy at all and a huge focus on climate change. Now I think this is really critical that this idea of peak oil and oil depletion come into this dialogue about how we transition away from cheap uh, fossil fuels. Now as an example, um, the province of British Columbia has actually a pretty decent climate action plan. Uh, we've got a new carbon tax and a number of other kind of interesting things around climate change. But when you zoom in on that, you see that there's only a small slice of that pie that is also going to reduce oil dependence. So when we look at that, we say, okay, we're spending all this time and effort on doing something, but we're not really increasing the resiliency of our local economy, our local food systems, and all these other things in the face of peak oil. Um, and part of this is sort of a cultural issue in that the province of British Columbia really has a hard time talking about peak oil or even coping with it. Um, locally, we're doing much better, but at the provincial level, it's pretty hopeless. And what we're seeing is that that lack of concern about transportation and oil going forward is translating into this sort of business as usual approach to infrastructure development. And what we're seeing is that we're siphoning away billions of dollars from something that could actually be useful to us into projects that most likely aren't going to be of any use at all. So of those two, peak oil versus climate change, I, I really see peak oil as a, it's a crisis of capitalism and economic growth. Um, whereas climate change is a global ecological crisis that could have economic or will have economic implications. But when we look at what we're doing in response to these, I think it's important to know that many of the things that we're doing in response to peak oil and liquid fuel shortage are very, very bad in terms of climate change. So if, if you just ignore peak oil, you might say, well, why the heck are we spending all this time you know, doing the things like the tar sands? you know, declining net energy return, all this stuff. But when you understand that the tar sands are producing this liquid fuel, which is very different than electricity, then all of a sudden it starts to, to make sense why it is that we're investing so much money into this. Um, so I think it's critical that when we start looking at the future, we need to understand that we're going to be fighting this fight over carbon emissions. And I think that ultimately, uh, climate change will be a litmus test on how we adapt to peak oil. Um, we're going to be needing to adapt to peak oil, and the question is, do our solutions harm the climate or make it better? On the flip side of that, there are many things that we are talking about doing in response to climate change that do nothing to reduce oil dependence. So I don't think there's anything wrong with wanting to plant trees as an offset or buy carbon offsets to do projects in other countries. Maybe these things are good things, but when you spend that money on those projects, you're doing nothing to increase the resiliency of your local economy in the face of oil depletion. So when I look at this going forward, it's, it's not about saying there's one silver bullet, but it's about saying of this big bundle of strategies that we have, let's try and focus on those things that are at the intersection of those two things. 
So peak oil and climate change. We have those actions, and Richard Gilbert just talked about a number of those. These are the things that reduce emissions and reduce oil dependence. So we're no longer in that position of saying, well, we don't want to do anything about climate change because China hasn't done anything yet. That's a really, it's a really a dead end argument because we're missing the opportunity to create a more resilient local post-carbon economy when we, were, when we push off working on these solutions that reduce oil dependence and reduce emissions. And of course, those are obviously transportation, land use, the way we organize our cities, and goods movement. Um, goods movement gets completely ignored um, I was at a conference recently at the Rocky Mountain Institute, and we were looking, was giving this presentation to people, uh, you know, the director of transportation for a Walmart and other, and we're talking about peak oil and the future of goods movement. And there's, there's very little recognition, whether even in those bodies, but even especially amongst those of us planning cities, about the real critical role that goods movement's going to play as we start trying to deal with peak oil. Now, the flip side of that is that well, if we can't move stuff as much, maybe we can build it locally. So we're going to see that we need to reduce how much transportation we need, and part of that is producing stuff more locally and creating a more local economy. So now the question is, okay, we can envision a low energy future. We can look to Europe or to other places, that island of Denmark, and say, okay, there's examples of how to live in a low energy future. For us, the question is, how do we get from here to there? If we cut the energy use in half tomorrow, it'd be chaos. So there's a real question of how do we get from here to there and do it with some degree of social and environmental justice. Um, so I want to start talking about what it means to be resilient as we go through this energy transition. And hopefully that's big enough to see, but I, there's basically, as I see it, there's two aspects of this. One is as planners working on designing things from the top down, we need to create more resilient infrastructures. These are things that are valuable to us across multiple futures. And then from the bottom up, it's about how do we create communities that are more resilient in the face of the types of shocks that we're going to be facing as we're forced to transition away from cheap oil and gas. So again, 